Now, I'm pleased to invite Wushik to present the webinar. Wushik, over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Kunal, and for the entire wider team for this uh, invitation. Uh, so today, I'll, uh, you know, our team at YRISE has been working on various aspects of uh, COVID response, especially the economic policy side of COVID response, and trying to work and support the governments of Bangladesh, uh, Nepal, Nigeria, Sierra Leone um, to do some of this work. And I'll try and highlight one theme that has become very clear in our data, which is that um, migrant families and remittance dependent families are experiencing this crisis a little bit differently, right? And that the, the policy reactions that we might need uh, for migrant families may be slightly different from non-migrant families. So I'm gonna draw on multiple data sets that I've worked on with our co-authors who are here, uh, Ashish, uh, Corey, Myra, uh, and others. Uh, uh, I'll draw on multiple data sets to, to highlight some of these things. So let me start by motivating why is it that we'd like to focus on migrants, especially when we think about low and middle income countries. So the graph that you see in front of you, right, has data from on migration rates from various samples around the world. Some we've collected and some that other researchers have collected, right? So this covers, you know, Nepal, many samples in Bangladesh, right, but also India um, and uh, Barbara's uh, country are on, or we discussed this country, Uganda, Kenya, uh, Ghana, Peru, et cetera, right? So something that's uh, very clear in the data is that for specific subpopulations in those countries that are studied by any of these researchers, right? The migration rate tends to be immense, very, very high. So, so migration is an important part of the livelihood strategy for many, many families around the world, especially in Africa and South Asia, okay? So you see in Nepal, this is a bit of an outlier, but some of our data is from the Western Terai where uh, two thirds of households send a migrant. Right? Uh, but even at the lower end in Peru and Honduras, you still have about a quarter of households or a fifth of households sending migrants. Okay? So, so I'm making the point that migration is, is common. Now, I actually wanna, uh, I'm curious about the audience's uh, thinking on this poll question that I have on the right. Okay? So what do you think the same fraction is for households in the United States? So the, the four options are less than 1%, 1 to 5%, 5 to 15%, or greater than 15. So I'll uh, give it a minute. We have a very evenly divided uh, 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 view, so let me let me end it there. So basically, we have about a third of household, a third of uh, respondents suggesting um, one to five percent, and about a third suggesting five to fifteen. Right? So it turns out the actual number is zero point two percent. So this situation is very, very different in uh, developing nations compared to industrialized countries. So, so the point here is that not only is it high in absolute terms, it's also very high in relative terms. Now, um, some other facts about the migration data is that they're often um, concentrated among specific regions or subpopulations. Okay, so for a few of these samples, like the U.S. is the national average, and then you see, um, you know, in Nepal, in India, in in, uh, in Uganda, we have the national averages. So what you observe is that the subpopulations studied by the researchers, right, often have migration rates that are higher than the national average. There's a big gap in Nepal, the uh, medium-sized gap in India, and, uh, and a smaller gap in Uganda. Right? So, all, but also, um, the reason I'm pointing that out is that that also suggests that perhaps if there's going to be policy responses for uh, migrant families, it's possible for us to identify subpopulations that we need to we need to target. Okay? And the other point that's uh, that's going to be that's going to play a critical role in our the policy lessons that we draw today is that you know you can migration can be of many different types. So sometimes it's sort of migration that looks full year or more permanent, right? Or even if it's not permanent, that people are gone for lengthy periods of time. They're gone for the entire year or for multi-year work contracts, right? Whereas there's other types of migrant, uh, migration as well, which is within year seasonal migration, temporary migration or circular migration, where people spend part of the year in one part of the country, 
and a different part of the year and a different part of the country, depending on say the agricultural seasons. Right? And so what we observe here is that these four uh, samples for in, in Peru, Bangladesh, India, Nepal, right, where we know about seasonal migration, the seasonal component of migration actually accounts for more than half of all of the, of the total migration. So the total is here and this is the seasonal portion of it. Total is here, this is the seasonal portion of it. This is like three quarters of all migration in central India seems to be seasonal in nature as opposed to uh, as opposed to full year. Okay, so that also suggests that not only can we are to identify particular subpopulations, we might also be able to identify and target particular times of the year when people need greater support, especially if COVID is going to interact with migration in some way. Right? Um, yeah, and um, and so what are what what are these policy lessons? So one is that you know we can identify uh, which population uh, we need to identify which populations are at risk, right? So areas with high migration, and also linkages to areas of sort of high exposure to COVID. Right? So one one other way to say it is that countries like Bangladesh and Nepal uh, that send a lot of migrants, say uh, international migrants elsewhere, right? Even if COVID had never reach those countries, even if there was not a single case of disease in those countries, those countries would still have been uh, very affected by the global COVID risk because the migration destinations that those migrants are going to from Nepal and sending remittances back, those destinations are being affected by the crisis. Right? And therefore there'll be an indirect remittance effect on, on those countries as well. Um, and, and the policy analysis should also focus on, you know, thinking about the time of the year when people are migrating, right? And if people are forced to return early, so for example, we, we observed that migrants from Nepal uh, to cities in India, they were all forced back because of Indian's lockdown. Uh, and like they rushed back home in early April within two weeks. Right? Those are migrants who were supposed to be away right now, earning money and sending money back home. So regardless of the food security situation right now, it also suggests to us that since those migrants are not doing what they're um, what they normally would be doing right now, working elsewhere and sending money back, then come November when those that money would have uh, really helped those families, we're going to see this gap and we're going to need to pay special attention to this. Right? Uh, so it also, I mean, thinking about the specific patterns of migration also allows us to think through like exactly when the shocks might hit and if, uh, you know, the situation is already very bad, but it might actually get even worse. All right, so, so now just to give you a quick set of results from our samples, um, we've collected data on multiple samples of households across uh, Bangladesh and Nepal, right? Um, so I'll, I'll leave it to the Q&A in case you have uh, uh, questions about the specific samples. I'll just highlight here that one of these samples is based on a visa lottery, so I'll highlight those results early. And what that means is that we also have very good empirical identification. We have lottery winners, lottery losers, so it's not an endogenous decision of migration that's governing whether or not uh, you know, the, the effects that we see in migrant versus non-migrant families are different. It's that we have uh, an explicit, like sort of a randomized lottery outcomes. So we can study very cleanly what life look, how life looks different during the COVID period for lottery winners versus lottery losers. Yeah. Okay, and here's what you see. So in 2013, uh, the Bangladesh government ran this lottery uh, for visas to Malaysia. The Bangladesh and Malaysian governments had a G2G, government to government agreement of sending Bangladeshi workers to work in plantations in Malaysia. Okay? And so since 2013, as we've been tracking these households, what you observe is that the people who were lucky enough to win the lottery and migrate to Malaysia, so they had much higher migration rates, and those families, when you, when you track them back home in Bangladesh, they've been doing a lot better, right? I guess it's not a surprise, when you win a lottery, so you get a visa and you um, access a labor market that's uh, offering much higher wages, then your family does better, right? So from 2013 to 2019, you observe much higher income. In fact, the income in some years go is about double, like 100% higher, right? And then what we, when we go back and talk to these families in April 2020, of course you see in the lottery losers, the gray bar, there's been a sharp decline in income. That's not news, everybody knows that after lockdowns, uh, all, all um, families have experienced sharp lockdowns. Okay, so now the question I have for you before I give, show you the answer. So we're doing a second poll now. Um, is is um, so what happens to income for these migrant families? This red bar, right? After the COVID nineteen. Okay, so here we're getting 
Um, okay, let me let me just let it run for another thirty seconds. All right, um, I think the answer has become clear. So let me end it now. So um, if you can see the results, all uh, so sharing. Uh, so the majority of you, almost two thirds of you, suggest that my, it, it fell by even more. And that actually uh, is the right answer. So what you see is that while these migrant families were doing better year after year after winning the lottery, post COVID, right? Uh, the situation's reverse. Now, now these migrant families are doing relatively poorly relative to non-migrant families, okay? So there is a decline uh, in income of, across all families, but it's a much sharper decline among migrant families. And uh, this is something that's not only true in that lottery data, right? But it's true for our other data as well. So here in income for Nepal, we observe that the situation, like the ranking doesn't reverse, but the amount of decrease in income for migrant families is larger than the amount of decrease from non-migrant families, right? Uh, and this is about food insecurity. You see that food insecurity has risen, but it's risen much more sharply for uh, migrant families. Okay. And um, why is it that migrant families are, are suffering more during this uh, crisis? So if you, when you look at specific sources of income, what you see both in Bangladesh and in Nepal is that remittances have dropped by a lot, right? And in the Bangladesh lottery, you see remittances dropping. Even the, even the lottery losers have found, some of them have found their way to, um, uh, to migrate elsewhere, maybe not in Malaysia, right? And you see among both groups, the remittances dropping, but the migrant dependent families, the drop, uh, the share of income that they're losing is much larger, right? Similarly in Nepal, this is the, when we were following this sample around month by month by month since October last year, right? You, ob you generally observe remittances in the range of about 4,900 rupees on average per month, right? And this is now after the lockdown got down to 1,700 rupees, right? So people are sending less money back. They're, my, the migrant my family members are sending less money back. And why, why is there less remittance income? Because one important reason is that the migrants were forced to return. So what you see is this is male migration in Nepal, right? So across the different seasons, so during the lean period, there's high migration rates. During the harvest, people come back, right? And this is also a festival period in Nepal, in rural Nepal, right? But then you observe that the mi out migration rate right now is very, very low relative to any other time during the year, right? So a lot of people have been forced to return. Right? And the second reason is not only have they been forced to return, but even the migrants who are away, they're sending less money back, okay? So, so this is the amount, say about 4,600, they send back month by month for people who are away in our, in our data for the last uh, several months of the year in 2019. But this is the amount that they're sending back right now. Okay, so both people are forced back and they're sending less back. Okay. And um, so, so then the question is, okay, so we're seeing this drop in income, people are coming back. So why isn't home income going up in order to make up for the fact that remittance income is coming down? And we think here, one, something that's uh, becoming more and more clear in the data, as well as lots of anecdotes that we're hearing from Bangladesh and Nepal, is that migrants are facing unusual amount of stigma right now because migrants are known to have carried the disease back into Bangladesh, into Nepal from other countries where the disease, uh, where COVID had hit earlier, right? And therefore, uh, people are more hesitant to work with them or allow them to do anything. Right. So normally, you know, in South Asia, migrant families are seen as like they're put on a pedestal because they're sending remittances back into the country and earning foreign exchange. But now the situation seems to have been reversed. So, so and, and some of it is actually true. So what you observe actually in our data that people with um, uh, COVID symptoms in, in one of our samples in Bangladesh are 33% more likely to be de denied medical treatment. Uh, there, 40% of returnees say that they're not supported by friends and relatives. And what I mean by some of it is true is that these stigma that's uh, emerging is coming from the fact that people who have some migration link though, or those communities do see higher symptoms. So we observe like this is like some CDC or WHO COVID symptoms, like things like dry cough or uh, dry cough, fever, fatigue, et cetera. And you see that, um, uh, that households which have returning migrants are much more likely to show those symptoms 
that households in Dunai. Right? And another data point is that um, um, so if you're in a community where in the previous two weeks there was a migrant who had returned, then in those communities, the, these symptoms, the WHO symptoms for, for COVID that I'm talking about, are about three times as likely for us to observe those symptoms than in communities where there was no returning. Okay? And so the stigma that we're observing here is partly due to the fact that people are observing, like we are in our data, that the, the presence of migrant attorneys is leading to uh, greater disease prevalence, right? And so people are rationally uh, in fear, but that also means that this pose, uh, poses a bigger policy challenge for us. The policy challenge is that migrants are forced back, they're no longer sending remittances back, they could be reintegrated into local economy, but that's not happening um, easily. There's a lot of friction there as well. So we really need to, uh, policymakers really need to think about and address these problems. Okay? And this correlation between uh, returnee presence and COVID symptoms uh, is so strong that if you look at, this is at the sub-district level in Bangladesh, right? So what we do is here, we're comparing on the x-axis, we're comparing the sub-districts that recently have returnees that came through airports, according to the Civil Aviation Authority of Bangladesh. That's the data, right? And what we observe is that if you have, if your sub-district has more returnees recently, right? The number of calls, distress calls you're making into a government COVID hotline in those sub-districts are much, much higher. So migrant returning presence, this is another piece of research that we did, is predictive of where these calls are gonna come from. It's also predictive of quarantines. And we've seen in the Philippines, in addition to Bangladesh, we've seen that it's also predictive of actual tested positive cases, right? So, so migration and um, positivity rates are actually quite strongly correlated to the extent that you can predict where the cases will emerge based on where people, migrants have re recently returned. All right, so I'm gonna say one final thing about, uh, about uh, one final aspect of this um, uh, uh, link between uh, uh, migration and uh, income risk and uh, food, food insecurity risk, which is there's a seasonal aspect to this. So they pointed out at the outset that there are um, certain seasons, certain parts of the year where migrants are more likely to be away. And so what, you, what you're observing here, so what I'm showing you here, the black line is our month by month by month data collected in a normal year. So, so take 2018, 2019, right? And what I have is on the y-axis is the share of households that are facing some food insecurity, right? They're saying they're having to miss meals, cut back on portion size, et cetera, right? So what you observe is that over the course of the year, there's certain parts of the year when food insecurity is very high in a normal year. And this is not a surprise. This corresponds to the pre-harvest lean season. So in Bangladesh, the main rice harvest is in December, January. You plant in July, August, right? So in between when you're waiting for the crop to grow, that's when food insecurity rises because there's not much work available in the rural areas. Wages are low during that period, et cetera, right? So food insecurity is high during that period. Now, luckily for us, both in Bangladesh and Nepal, COVID hit at a time when food insecurity is relatively low, right? And even then, even this period that's supposed to be a good period in a normal year, you're seeing that in migrant families, food insecurity has gone up very high, right? So even in a good period, we're seeing this, seeing this effect, right? So I really am worried about what will happen to these households, right? If this lockdown continues and the disease continues, and we're in this period where they will be hit by the double whammy of both regular food insecurity, and on top of that, the lockdown effect that we see here. Right? So this is something that policymakers really should be thinking about carefully. Right? That's another point that we want to highlight from, from our data. This is true in Bangladesh, and this is also true in Nepal. Um, so so in, in, in Nepal as well, uh, you know, we have this period in August that's coming, and that's going to be a seasonal food insecurity period, normal food insecurity. And, and that's a period that we are, uh, that we are really uh, much more worried about. Okay, so let me just summarize and end. Um, so remittance, um, remittances of migrant workers are an important source of income, especially in, we know in South Asia and in some parts of Africa. Um, migrant sending households have clearly experienced sharper declines in income than families that are not as dependent on remittances. And then there, we have the, 
that we have this coupled with a separate public health problem, which is migrant returning presence in the community is associated with greater likelihood of observing COVID-19 symptoms, right? So the, so the coupling of this problem where the migrant families are earning less income, plus they're facing some stigma is going to lead to uh, much more difficulty for, for them to deal with the crisis. Right. And this is not, I mean, I showed you a lot of microdata in order to establish what is happening at the household level, but this is also going to show up at the macro scale because um, many of these countries like Bangladesh and Nepal are quite remittance dependent. Like more than a fifth of Nepal's GDP comes from remittances. About 10% of Bangladesh's GDP comes from remittances. And the World Bank is estimating, just based on these predictions, that there'll be a 22% drop in remittance in South Asia. And I have to point out here, that some of these drops have not yet been observed, right? So partly because it was Ramadan, so many people were sending money back more than usual. And another one is that if migrants are being forced to return home, they're actually like liquidating their assets and sending them back home because they're being deported from other countries where uh, that are also worried about like destinations in the Middle East that are also worried about COVID presence in their, in their countries. We know in Singapore, for example, the, the COVID outbreak was in the migrant dormitories, right? And so even if it's not showing up in the macro data yet, our micro data suggests that there is a lot for us to uh, worry about. Uh, let me end there and uh, stop sharing my screen. And I'm looking forward to Barbara's comments. Uh, thank you for being with us, Barbara. So Barbara, over to you. Thanks, Mushrik. You're on mute. So there you go. Thank you. Thank you, Mush. Um, great presentation. Um, I'd like to start by commending the multidisciplinary nature of the work that Mushfiq and um, team are undertaking. And the reason for this is that the COVID-19 pandemic has actually brought to the fore the gaps in social policy. And one observes that across the globe, the knee-jerk reaction was fiscal stimulus, throwing money, um, at the problem without understanding the underlying um, impact of um, the pandemic. So I think that this work enables us to see that with data and um, with analysis of target groups, it makes it much easier to then have evidence-based um, policy making. Starting off with migration, um, as Mushfiq says, in most of our countries, um, it's an important livelihood strategy and coping mechanism. You have a lot of uh, migrant, but also non-migrant households that will be affected, depending on what region. Whereas in Bangladesh and Nepal, you've been able to very specifically focus on agricultural communities and migrant households. One could argue that in some of our countries, Uganda, for example, um, you will find that you do have non-migrant households, but at least one or two members of that household have migrated internationally and send remittances home. Nigeria is one of those countries where remittances are important um, for economic survival. And therefore, it will be interesting for further research by those that are interested in looking at similar issues to look at how are non-migrant households being impacted when the person that's bringing in or looking after the family can no longer send back as much money because in the destination country, they're probably not working full time as they were. They are also facing challenges. Or when someone is forced to return home and cannot find employment because they cannot be reintegrated into the labor market. So that is uh, one of those um, pointers that one needs to bear in mind. I found it very interesting, uh, the Bangladesh visa lottery um, analysis. Again, that is a very um, specific group. But one wonders, um, a lot of these um, visa lottery households or individuals are basically sending remittances back to support families that may not necessarily be part of the migrant community. And so what is 
How, how is that playing out? What is the impact um, given um, this pandemic? The system of migration in agricultural communities, um, this is something that is being observed in a lot of agricultural communities across the world. Um, the lean season, as opposed to the peak seasons. And as you rightly say, um, the impact is bound to be much higher during the lower productivity um, periods. It would have been nice to hear from you what sort of policies, does this therefore make it much easier for government to focus on providing support at a particular time? So the sequencing of um, government measures is made much easier once they have these kind of results. When it comes to the high COVID incidence at migration destinations and also the fact that the returnee presence is associated with the um, high incidence of COVID, I'd like to give an example from Nigeria. Nigeria has a rather peculiar example of what has happened during this COVID-19 pandemic. We have what we call the Almajiri. The Almajiri are young children that are normally sent away from home to study the Quran under the guidance of an Imam or a Malam. And so what you have particularly in Northern Nigeria is this Almajiri that had originally migrated for Quranic education, but be due to extreme poverty are now on the street begging. So the COVID-19 pandemic started about the same time that the state governors of Northern Nigeria had decided to send these children back to their states of origin. You could call this a forced migration. While this happened, COVID-19 um, infections were on the rise. So one of the states, Kaduna State, found that a lot of the returnees were infected. They very quickly had to isolate the returnees, test, isolate, and then think of how best to reintegrate these children into the community. So the governor of the state and his team decided that once this infected group of children had recovered, they would very quickly see how best to settle them within the community and ensure that they had access to health and education facilities rather than them going back onto the street. I give this as an example of how, when you have a very specific group, you can also target um, this group with very specific measures. And this is something that um, I find interesting in the study on um, migrants in Bangladesh and Nepal. Coming to remittances, there is definitely a loss in remittance income as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. What we've observed in many African countries is that governments have had no choice but to evacuate their citizens from countries like China, UAE, South Africa. Many of these are migrants that have been stranded I would assume that a good number of them are low level workers and, and therefore have found that they have no option but to come back home. Upon returning, many of them go into isolation, self-isolation. Some of them in countries like Uganda, not far from the international airport, there are a couple of hotels where they are taken to for at least 14 days. What is worrisome is how do we reintegrate them into economies that have already faced high loss of jobs, 
into economies where they may require to be retrained. So it would be good to hear from you, what are the sort of strategies would you advise on skills retraining and reintegration into the labor market? Finally, I'd like to comment on the food insecurity. The issue of food insecurity is important and particularly sensitive because if governments are not able to address this, then we will have social unrest. And I think in Nigeria, in Lagos, we did see some areas where some of the youth were getting very agitated because there was a lockdown, they're not able to get their daily wages, they're food insecure, then what do you do? But it would be good to hear from Mushfiq what therefore happens or what strategies have the governments taken in Nepal and Bangladesh in terms of food insecurity? We have had governments that have gone out and distributed food. This is not sustainable. In many of our countries, we do not have um, established social welfare and social protection systems. And if we have a second wave of COVID-19, what then will we do? Interestingly enough, in countries like Uganda, where food security is much more evenly dis distributed across the country, you find that food prices have actually fallen. So there's been a decline in food prices. And thus far, there hasn't been a lot of agitation by households with regard to food insecurity. It's rather been more about wanting to be sensitized, um, accessibility to masks. I know we all keep re recommending that everyone should wear a mask. These masks cost money. And if you're earning daily wages, you're probably not going to be able to spare um, 50 cents or a dollar to buy a mask. So how about having free distribution of masks combined with distribution of support in kind, cash transfers, cash handouts. These are all measures that we will need to look at in the policy space. And I'd like to hear from you, how have Bangladesh and Nepal governments dealt with these um, policy issues? I think I'll end right there. Well, thank you, Barbara. That was a really excellent set of comments. If I'm wondering that, Mushfiq, uh, you might want to respond to them maybe for four or five minutes because there's a very interesting comparison between Africa and South Asia. So do you want to uh, respond? Yes, yes please. Um, so first of all, congratulations to Kunal and to the wider team for actually putting this particular pair of uh, speakers together. I come from a research background, but uh, Barbara's excellent comments make clear that she has really strong policy background as well. Um, and this is exactly the type of conversation that we, uh, that we need in order to think you know, creatively and innovatively about policies that we need in order to address this very novel crisis that's in our hands right now. Um, and Barbara, um, I mean, raised so many interesting issues that I think we could have a one hour conversation about all of these in addition to the, the research. And maybe Barbara, you and I can figure out a forum to, to do this, but let me try really short and, and therefore uh, necessarily incomplete answers uh, to your questions. Okay. So one quick clarification is that, oh, Barbara, you know, was mentioning like migrant members and non-migrant, I mean, members of the families that remain behind. That's actually also the typical situation in South Asia, just like in Africa, right? So there's a migrant who's away and then the family is remaining behind. And really a lot of our data that, you, uh, you know, you should read it as, okay, what's happening to the um, to the households that are remaining, the household members that are remaining behind, and then the migrant is now forced back to join them. Okay. And, um, and then, okay, so uh, let me, yeah, let me just focus on the more important, what I think are the more important things for the audience to hear about. So one is about policies. Okay, okay, so now how do we deal, I mean, I, we raised a lot of problems in our data, and now the question is, how do we think about designing policy to address them, right? So one simple point I want I tried to make early in the talk is that because the migration is 
more um, heavily focused during certain times of the year, right? And, uh, and certain types of families. So it's somewhat predictable exactly where we need to focus our policy attention. So part of our goal here is to just say, look, in your country, you'll be able to, you know from previous patterns exactly where the migrants come from, where they go to, and what parts of the year they're likely to be away, when they are away versus when are they sending money back home, right? We know this from previous years of data, right? So now the point is that those patterns are suddenly changing because of the COVID crisis. And we need to design policies that are appropriate given the timing of the migration, given the specific regions of origin and the regions of destination, okay? And now then thinking about, okay, a lot of international migrants are now forced back. They've been deported back from the Middle East and from uh, like East Asia for the, in the case of South Asian migrants, right? Um, but in, in general, what I'm talking about is, again, in, in Nigeria, there's also, you know, workers who work in the Middle East, will have some, some of the similar patterns uh, in Africa as well. Now the, now the question is, okay, so these migrants are forced back. So what do you do with them? Okay. So I think of uh, two, two potential directions to go, right? Uh, plus a third one that might not be so obvious. The two potential directions to go is that, oh, we need to re either reintegrate them into the local economy, figure out like what is it that they can do and how do we enable them to contribute productively to the local economy? What type of policies should we be uh, devising in order to help them reintegrate? The reintegration is one. And the other possibility is, of course, the repatriation because the very reason that the migrants live in this, uh, in this destination is because there is demand for their labor there, right? So the fact that the Kuwaitis or the Qataris or Emiratis or Saudis are hiring these migrants or Malaysians or Singaporeans, right? Those needs are still gonna be there, right? So then the question becomes, how do we create the conditions such that they can repatriate to where they, the destination where they came from and go back to productively contributing to those societies and sending some of their money back home for other family members to, uh, uh, as, as a maintenance income, okay? So that might, okay, so each of these strategies will require different types of policy analysis. So I think what I've been trying to propose to the Bangladesh government, and I think this is useful for maybe other governments to think about as well, is that let's think, of, you know, we should do some policy analysis to think about Okay, what is it that UAE or Qatar or Saudi Arabia or Malaysia or Singapore or Korea thinking about, right? Under what conditions will they allow migrants back, right? Is it that we need to quarantine them for a while? Is it that we need to do testing? If, do we need to do isolation, right? What will make them feel comfortable, right? And then, so that's part of it. Like, let's understand what they need and then create the conditions and provide the support, facilitate that repatriation process. It might also require a lot of diplomatic channel work, not just research work, right? Where the foreign ministries have to get involved, the embassies have to get involved in order to understand these bilateral decisions on Nepal, Qatar, or Bangladesh, Malaysia, right? Uh, how, how do we recreate the conditions for migration? And then on the reintegration side, the part that's not obvious, but BRAC, a very you know, large and impressive NGO that operates in Bangladesh and in many other countries now, um, so they have um, a migration uh, sort of reintegration program that they already had, but they really need to sort of rethink and scale that up right now, given the large number of deportees coming back. And there, what we've learned from them is that it turns out mental health support is quite critical for migrants to come back, right? So there's not only hard skills that, that we need to be thinking about, but also soft skills and soft like uh, by soft, I mean other important, but not uh, issues like sitting in a classroom and retraining, right? That we also need to think about carefully. All right, so then final uh, two points that uh, Barbara made that I'll only briefly touch on, okay? So one is about mask distribution, okay? Here I want to, so we are also at YRISE, we're doing multiple uh, types of research and not only on migration. So for example, we are trying to prepare for a large scale mass-based randomized control trial in Bangladesh. Okay. And what we've learned there is, you know, initially, like when we started collecting data in April, right? Um, so mass use, of course, in a baseline was low. And then we saw sharp increases in people reporting to us that they own mass, right? The numbers went up to like 80, 90%, both in Bangladesh and Nepal. Okay. So then at that point, you know, we did have uh, an agreement to, to like distribute mass at that time with a donor. And then we kind of said, oh, you know, actually don't worry about this, keep your money because we, uh, 
uh, it turns out the problem appears to have been solved. Right? But then as we continue tracking, it turns out mask ownership rates are actually a lot higher than actual mask usage rates. It seems like only a third of households or a third of people are actually uh, con consistently wearing their masks and masks are not so useful if they're not wearing them. So therefore, uh, you know, Barbara's point on mass distribution, it turns out what's clear now in, in our data is that it's not only mass distribution that's required, but you also have to pair that with some kind of like institutional uh, interventions where you have to think about monitoring and enforcement of mask wearing norms, especially in places like mosques and markets where people are getting together at, at high density, right? So we, we need a kind of a broader intervention strategy. And then uh, Barbara, lastly, also pointed out cash handouts, right? And here the a problem, a fundamental problem that we are facing in Nigeria, in Bangladesh, and many other countries in Togo, that it's not easy for us to suddenly identify who is the poor, and especially who's the new poor who are suffering more during this crisis, right? Identify them and target money to them, right? That's a pretty complicated task. Like if you think about Bangladesh, Nigeria countries with populations upwards of 160 million people, right? Identifying the poor quickly is not so easy. And so here, this is how actually Barbara and I first connected by our very common, our common good friend, Hakim Belosagi, who's in, um, who's in Nigeria. And, um, you know, we, we need to support governments in order to develop new types of infrastructure and like targeting infrastructure that allows us to very quickly um, you know, target um, uh, target support. Okay, so let me stop there because if I start talking about targeting, that'll take another hour. Uh, <laughs> that's a pretty complicated problem. Okay. Uh, thanks, Mushfiq. Uh, I had a couple of questions before. Uh, uh, also, uh, so if others can send in the questions in the Q and A feature, that'd be great. Um, I had two questions on both on the type of migration, migrants themselves, domestic versus international migrants. The stigma associated with international migrants probably would be higher, right, than domestic migrants. So did you observe that? Did you see that domestic migrants coming back from Dhaka, back to their villages, the stigma associated with them, and therefore their reintegration of the labor markets in the local village, in the local communities, is less of a problem than somebody coming back from Malaysia? So that's the first question. Second is that there must be a difference between temporary migrants um, going to Malaysia, for example, on temporary residence permits, versus permanent migrants, a lot of Bangladeshis are also, as you know, in the UK on a long-term basis in terms of remittance flows. So do we have any data that remittance flows from the long-term migrants is still as stable as before versus the ones who obviously went to countries where there were long-term policies and temporary residence per, uh, permits would obviously be coming back to, uh, to Bangladesh and therefore there we can see a significant income decline. So is there any evidence to suggest that the, the nature of migrant, duration of migration, and where do migrants go internationally or domestic makes a difference here? Okay, so uh, those are excellent questions, but really difficult to answer with the with the data that we currently have. Um, so one one thing I'll, I'll mention, kind of indirectly, I'll take the question in reverse order, that um, you know, it is clear in the data in like one the one scatter plot I showed you, right? What we learned from that data, uh, because here, there we have like, uh, we are using data on migration permits uh, handed out in Bangladesh to any migrants going anywhere uh, around the world, right? So something that's very clear is that the shock is larger when you're thinking about other countries where the number of cases, early cases was larger. So for example, there's a lot, many Bangladeshis actually also go to Italy. That's a popular destination, right? And the very districts that are, or sub-districts that are connected to Italy, because, you know, as you know, Kunal, that, you know, some destinations are more popular because migration is kind of a network good, mm -hmm. right? Some destinations are more popular in certain districts, other destinations, the UK is more popular in different districts, right? And what you observe is that, like, what's happening back home in the country is quite strict, or quite uh, nicely tied to, uh, or predictably tied to the destination and how they're experiencing the crisis, okay? And so the way for us to move forward with that analysis is that we do need to pay attention to sort of these bilateral connections, not only at the country to country level, but at like the sub-district to specific location level. Okay, so yeah, your, your point about destination from our data is absolutely valid, right? And then the second question about stigma, is it more among domestic or international? Actually, I have to honestly say, I don't know, right? 
Um, you could be right that maybe international migrants would face more stigma. I think I think that I think people are updating pretty quickly. So my guess is, but take this with a grain of salt because this is not based on data. Okay, my guess is that initially, like back in April, most of the stigma was associated with like migrants returning from Singapore, Italy. So there's international migrants, right? But now increasingly because the disease has moved from being internationally transmitted to being locally transmitted. So once you think about local transmission, that's when more of the stigma is now rationally associated with movements within the country. Okay. Um, I have a, one question here from the audience, which is a kind of a tricky question. Uh, it comes to back to what I think Barbara was also talking about, which you responded to some, to some extent. So let's think about the future. So this migrants coming from Malaysia, who went to Malaysia came back, when they go back to Malaysia or to other uh, other countries where they where they are where they were working before, how can we make sure that they get better working conditions in those? Countries? Because one thing we learned from this whole episode is how bad the working conditions were. Were you mentioned Singapore as an example there? Yeah. So is there a way you think that one can try to actually bring about change in the long term when they return to the countries where they're working in before, or is that not something that's possible? So yes, I mean, that's an excellent question because it also cuts across. I mean, that's not COVID specific at all. That's a general problem that the world must try to address, right? And let me, you know, let me tell you about small efforts that are being made to address it and we can think about whether or not uh, uh, these are sensible ideas. So this G2G program that I, uh, that I mentioned between Bangladesh and Malaysia, the government to government program, the very emergence of the program was in reaction to the abuse and that, that migrants often face um, or the migrants are taken advantage of by unscrupulous sort of middlemen, right? So the idea is that there are, there are these, um, you know, private sector entities that act as uh, dalal's uh, middlemen um, between, uh, between the destination employers and the migrants who are coming from places like Bangladesh, Nepal, and India. And they often, you know, extract a lot of the rent, right? That these, um, Families have to pay them a lot uh, upfront and ongoing, and on top of that, you know they they you know they they put them with employers who can also take care uh, take advantage of the migrants. And the whole point of the G2G agreement was, oh, let's let's uh, weed out these middlemen and let's do a direct government to government agreement, and that way they'll have some uh, stronger legal protection. Right now, these arguments, I mean, these programs itself is actually I would say met with at, at best mixed success. So like the Bangladesh Malaysia program was supposed to take tens of thousands of migrants. Ultimately, it only took uh, less than 10,000. Right? Um, and it hasn't, it, it hasn't, I mean, that particular program has not uh, been uh, sort of replicated uh, and, and scaled up. However, there, I mean, the concept now came in and there's now other g 2 programs, right? So I think we need to all think, just like we're talking about this COVID crisis, this is an excellent question. We also keep need uh, need, need to keep thinking creatively about how to provide some migrant rights. And that is fundamentally a multidisciplinary um, question, right? It not only requires research, it requires like legal, like legal research as well as legal efforts. And of course it requires uh, the participation of governments and diplomats and policymakers. Thanks. Well, Shrika, I've got a couple of questions from Casey Hari. So Casey Hari is asking that, what are the gender dimensions of this, what you're seeing in Bangladesh and Nepal? So is, that, is there a way to look at the gender dimensions of this issue? And secondly, obviously, uh, migrant income is very important for non-migrants too, in the spillover effects and so on. So in a sense, uh, what do we know about the fact that we are seeing this big in decrease in migrant incomes on the incomes of non-migrants? Is there a way to, to look at that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, excellent question. So the first one on, um, on the gender dimensions. So I'll actually mention here that, you know, the seasonal migrants we talk about in Bangladesh and Nepal, which is actually the most common form of migration, like temporary seasonal migration, is overwhelm overwhelmingly male, right? So it's males who, um, uh, like in Bangladesh, I know the numbers because we've tracked this year after year after year, we're talking about 99 to 100% of these types of migrants who are the poorest of the poor migrating, like agricultural laborers. Of course, in Bangladesh, there is a separate population, which is not the subject of what we're seeing here, which is garment workers. So, so sometimes you have in Bangladesh, there's a big ready-made garment industry. So you have young women who leave home and live in dormitories in, in the garment factories. And um, 
and and work um, you know close and live close to the factories and work at the factories um, and send money back home. So so of course you know there are both types of migrants and um, and 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 both types of families will be affected. So so just to give you the um, ready-made garment story, um, as soon as COVID hit, even before COVID arrived in Bangladesh, because it arrived in Europe and North America early, which which are our main export destination for garments like immediately all these orders got canceled. And it was even worse than that, whereas many of the buyers were refusing to actually pay for the orders that they had al already made because the contract were sort of, you know, not pay in advance contracts, right? And so that led to many, many, um, uh, you know, uh, young women being out of work, right? And other research that I had done in partnership with um, Rachel Heath at the University of Washington, so we found that these garment sector jobs are extremely important for, um, for women's lives in a variety of ways. So for example, not only once you get access to these jobs, right, not only is it that you earn income, but it turns out that in those villages, when parents see that women can now work in factories if they have a little bit of skill, the parents become much more likely to put their daughters in school, even relative to her own brother, right? And those families, you know, fast forward 10, 15 years, those women, become less likely to be married off at the age of 16 or having their first childbirth at the age of 18, right? So if you observe, so we've documented this very uh, carefully in the data for, uh, you know, collected uh, much earlier and over many years. And, uh, and so if you see, you know, these types of jobs now disappearing because of, you know, international supply chains breaking down, that's going to have some adverse effects on young women. Um, so that's from different research, but all the data that I suggested today suggests that men are actually bearing the brunt of the, um, uh, the migration crisis, where suddenly when, um, you know, like low-income men are forced back to the home countries, right, they're suddenly, you know, uh, forced back from India to Nepal, and that's become a really uh, complicated situation for those migrants. Right. Uh, there's a question which I think is probably more relevant for the Indian experience, but the question is about the fact that what we saw in the case of India, I would say, maybe uh, less so in Bangladesh and Nepal, is a very drastic lockdown policy when migrants almost evicted from the cities uh, after, after some time. Well, first they were initially stuck there, then they, then they were pretty much evicted. So that trust between the state and the migrant uh, in this pandemic has eroded a lot. I'm not sure that's the case in Bangladesh and Nepal, but could you speak about this particular question? I think it's an important question also, how migrants are treated as citizens in their own countries. Yeah, so something that's become clear in India is that you know a lot of state level policies end up mattering, right? So when we talk about how migrants are treated within their own countries, you know the the first example that comes to everybody's mind is China, right? Which is uh, virtually the only country in the world that has explicit like formal restrictions, or or like an internal visa system, like if, if to the called the Huko system. So if you don't have a hukou for Beijing or Shanghai, then even if you work there as a migrant laborer or in Guangzhou or any 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 of the high wage cities, right? Then many of your rights are um, are not protected. And so, for example, your children don't have a might not have a right to get an education there. You might not have good housing rights, and so you're forced to leave your family back at home, right? Um, so that's uh, so the explicit uh, limitation of rights in China is well known. Now in India, some of these same in effect, some of these same policies exist, right? So just as an example, like PDS system, the public food distribution system, right? Now, if the PDS card is something that you cannot easily port from one location to another, right? Mm. Then that's going to have an effect on people's decisions, right? So it, like, so for example, if I can't get food, uh, you know, subsidized food distribution at the destination because my PDS card doesn't work there, right? Then I'm gonna suddenly be forced back, right? So there's, there's ways in which, in effect, in India, there are restrictions in being put on internal migrants, right? Mm. And as you pointed out, the other, uh, you know, I, I think this was really, and there's not no other way to say it other than a big screw up and without thinking carefully about the effects. So when India imposed a lockdown, from the first public health perspective, maybe that was a sensible thing to do, right? But it is also important for the government to think about you know, what are economies made of, where people are versus where they live, where they work versus where they live, right? And if I suddenly put a very, um, you know, stringent restriction on public transit, right? Or any kind of inter-district or inter-state uh, travel, then that's going to have disproportionate effects on, the, on, these, on, on these poor migrants, right? And I think just the, 
mechanics and specific implementation of the policy just was not thought through carefully in the same way that when the US uh, suddenly imposed uh, you know, overnight of flight restrictions between the EU and the United States, right? they didn't think carefully about, okay, how is it that all the Americans who are now abroad, who are stranded abroad, are gonna get home? And so what ended up happening was suddenly you had everybody congesting at airports, and if anything, that led to sort of super spreader events. So implementation is critical. So it's not just about policy design. We need to actually think about the specific steps of implementation. Yeah. I have one final question for you. And I know we've been writing about it quite a bit. Uh, how practical is it to have lockdown policies of the kind you've seen in the Western countries in countries like in South Asia, or also perhaps also in Africa? Yeah. So, so you know, the life versus <laughs> life question. Yeah, the, that, that trade-off is much more difficult, right? I think... Um, you know, here I'll just give you like the key insights that come out of uh, out of the modeling, like even the epidemiological modeling, the same modeling that produces answers like we should be locking down in, in say US or Europe. Okay, so what you learn from that work is, I mean, if you just apply the same epi epidemiological models on low middle income country data separate from high income country data, what you learn is one, uh, that the age structure of the population is very different in lower income countries, right? There's not as many elderly, partly because birth rates are higher, so the population skews younger, right? So that means that this, the risk, the, 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 the disease risk and the risk of fatality is gonna be very different, right? It's, it's thankfully lower in poorer countries, right? Just because uh, we have younger populations. And second, um, you know, if we are going to impose lockdown policies with the goal of flattening curves, right? Like you're trying to flatten the curve below the healthcare capacity. Now that if the healthcare capacity line is extremely low, right, then um, then you know flattening and delaying infections doesn't actually save a lot more lives. So that's another way in which rich and poor countries might be different, right? And finally, you know, compare. You know, those are how the benefits are different. So you got to compare it against the cost. And for the cost side, the main issue is that in a rich country like you and I living in. Um, US or Finland, right? We can sit at home, get our work done as we are right now. Right? And we're still getting a paycheck, right? Now for a, um, like a day wage laborer whose who's, uh, weekly earnings actually feed a particular family. And if they don't have earnings that week, like the family may not have food. As we saw food insecurity is going up, people are having to cut back on meals. If it's it's much harder proposition to tell them to just like lock down indefinitely and, and stay at home indefinitely, right? Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's so, so basically what that means is that in poor countries, it's not really a live versus livelihoods debate. It's really a lives loss versus lives loss debate, right? Because malnutrition, hunger, et cetera, are also public health problems, right? So, so I, I don't think the answers are like a one size fits all policy is sensible to apply across the world, right? Countries really do need to think about exactly what is at high risk and what factors pose the highest risk in those countries. Thanks, Mushfiq. Thank you so much. Thank you, Barbara. We come to the end of this of this particular webinar. And I should say to the audience that uh, we have also Mushfiq's recent writings on our website on the specific page on, on, this, on this webinar. So please do take a look at those uh, articles and blogs. And thank you so much for participating. Thanks, Mushfiq. Thanks, Barbara. And thanks to Ashish, Myra, and Corey, who have been busily responding to questions coming in the Q&A themselves. So thank you for, for your participation. And uh, hopefully, uh, I'll see many of you in the next webinar, that's the same day, same time next week, all of you are bargain, poverty in COVID-19 developing countries. Thanks very much. <laughs>